The role of surgery is to reduce pain, to improve alignment, and to optimize function. And you'll hear me say a lot tonight, uh, with almost everything I'm going to talk about, I, I always recommend not doing surgery first. Surgery is sort of uh, only, for, uh, only for those that, that fail other treatments. I'm going to talk a little bit about both because, you know, oh, I'm a surgeon and that's what's fun to talk about. So <clears throat> um, healthy feet are very important. I can tell you this. Very important to, uh, to keep your feet healthy. It allows you to stay active. It allows you to stay young. It allows you to keep all the other organs healthy. It keeps your lungs healthy, your heart healthy, your muscles healthy. So the feet are, are really important. I always say to, to my other colleagues, the feet are the most important because without the feet, you can't exercise the knees and the hips and, and, uh, and the heart and all that kind of stuff. So um, <clears throat> uh, healthy feet can keep, can keep you pain free, help you keep your strength and balance. Um, good balance can prevent falls, which is a, uh, becomes a big problem obviously as we get older. Um, and uh, uh, our goal is to prevent deformities before they get worse and before they really start to impact function. So uh, there are a number of, of uh, common problems that can affect pressure distribution of the feet that can lead to pain, balance problems, and falls. Uh, I'm going to talk about three today, um, and that's primarily in the interest of time. Bunions, um, arthritis in the, in the toes, and uh, problems with the lesser toes, and, and I'll talk about the, those sort of generally. My goal here is to introduce you to, to some of the terms to show you kind of what we look at in terms of x-rays and, and when we examine patients. And, uh, and tell you when we start to say well, this is something we should probably fix, and then I'll tell you a little bit about what it means to fix it. I took some slides from, from lectures that I give to residents. Last time I was here, uh, I, my impression was that the crowd was pretty sophisticated. So um, I, I do use a lot of medical terms, and uh, so please don't hesitate to raise your hand or ask at the end if I, if I say something that's, uh, um, that's too, uh, too medical ease. Um, so my objective today is going to be bunions, um, disorders of the, of the lesser toes. The lesser toes are not because they're less important, but uh, that's just what we call uh, numbers two through five, uh, for those of you who have, uh, have all five. Um, uh, the hallux is uh, what we call the big toe. <clears throat> so uh, before I get started, one thing to mention, uh, the importance of footwear. So inappropriate footwear um, is a very common contributor to foot problems, uh, in particular the three things that we're going to talk about today. Um, it, it's uh, important in general. Um, to select shoes for everyday use that have these six things. They gotta fit both in the front and the back, so they can't be too tight, they can't be too short. Um, usually a low, broad heel is best for balance. Um, so I know a lot of, that, that does not include the stiletto heels. Um, so a low, broad heel, a firm heel collar and counter, uh, some mechanism of fastening, so that can be uh, you know, obviously laces or Velcro or something like that. Um, uh, thin and firm, non-slip soles, so you don't want something that's real slippery, especially when you're wearing socks, and some on the upper, uh, uh, upper lining that's breathable, so kind of a, a, an open material that, so things won't get too hot. Um, sometimes with folks that have uh, uh, those deformed feet or, or misshapen feet, I'll send them to a specialty shoe store where they can have shoes tailored or modified to fit their foot, and it's surprising how helpful that can be. Um, uh, in a lot of folks um, to improve their function. And the orthotics, we use them a lot um, to uh, accommodate foot alignment and, and sort of take away pressure points. So I'm gonna start with bunions. Um, we, uh, bunions is, is sort of synonymous with halgus, hallux valgus. So in, in the medical world, we kind of use the terms interchangeably, but they actually mean something different. Bunion comes from the Greek word for turnip, um, uh, which is what, uh, what uh, the bunion originally looked like, this big, re big red bump on the inside part of the foot. Um, so that, that's what the bunion is, this actual bump. And I'm going to use uh, my cursor, because that's what I was directed to do, maybe. So that's this bump here. Hallux valgus refers to the position of the toe. You'll notice in, in bunions, as you can see on this picture, if you've ever seen a foot with a bunion, the toe goes to the outside. So the bunion's on the inside, the toe goes to the outside. So that's hallux valgus. Um, and, uh, <clears throat> and that's the term that we use when we, uh, when we talk about it. So how does it happen? Well, there, we don't know the exact cause in everybody. We do know that there's a genetic component to it. I see a lot of folks, especially younger folks, who say my mother, my grandmother had these terrible looking feet um, and I had to get them fixed or, or maybe didn't get them fixed. Um, they are more common in women. So what happens is something leads the toe to start to go to the outside there. There, is, there are several tendons that attach to the toe right here. This one on top is called the EHL. It's the extensor hallucis longus. And the one on the bottom is called the FHL. Um, those two tendons attach on the, on the tip of the toe. So as the, as the toe goes, starts going to the outside, 
it acts like a bow and arrow. So if you can kind of imagine when you pull the string on a, on a bow, that's what's happening when you're, when you're uh, exercising the tenons, which you do every time you walk. So the string pulls the bow and the deformity gets worse. So that causes this bone called the metatarsal to go to the inside and then the toe to go to the outside. And so that's hallux valgus. And the bump that you see is actually a normal bone. It's this, the head of this metatarsal bone that's sort of sticking out and prominent. So um, when we look at folks clinically, I always look at their big toe. We often see rotation, as you do in this case, where the toe starts to rotate out a little bit funny. Um, and then when the, when the big toe starts to go to the outside, the little toes don't know where else to go. So they start to pop up, and you develop these hammer toe deformities, which I'll talk about in a second. So what are the factors that cause these? Extrinsic factors, shoes, number one for sure. Bunions are 15 times more common in populations that wear shoes than in populations that don't wear shoes. Now, obviously, those are um, uh, you know, sort of um, not on this continent, <laughs> but since uh, most, uh, most of the populations that we treat um, are shod or, or wear shoes. So bunions are far more common in, in uh, populations that wear shoes. There's a couple of x-rays in, in, uh, in folks with narrow shoes. So you can kind of see how things get bunched over, and the toes start to get pushed to the outside. This starts to get a little bit sore, and that's, uh, that's what leads folks to my office. So intrinsic factors, meaning factors in patients themselves, heredity and genetics is probably number one. That's probably the thing that triggers it. Um, incompetent soft tissues, again, as we get more experience in our toes, the tissues will stretch out. Uh, those tendons will get a little bit tighter, and the deformities will get worse. Hypermobile feet, uh, meaning just really, really flexible joints. Um, and then some people just have anatomy that predisposes them for it. If you have a, a wide foot, which some people have naturally, you wear a tight shoe and that toe is going to get pushed to the outside and, uh, and a bunion will get worse. We see it a lot in patients with inflammatory arthritis like rheumatoid arthritis. Um, so those are, those are common as well. We'll always get x-rays anytime you go to see a, a, you know, a, a musculoskeletal doctor, an orthopedist, et cetera. Uh, we're going to get x-rays. These are the views that I'll typically get. I'm going to show you the angles because if you ever end up talking to somebody about this, um, it, it might be useful to know. Uh, I'll tell you again, that's the metatarsal bone. That's the hallux or first metatarsal. That's the second metatarsal. So the first angle we look at is the hallux valgus angle. That's the angle of the metatarsal relative to the phalanx, which are the bones in the toe. Normal should be less than 15 degrees. As you can see, this one's probably about 60 degrees. So that's an abnormal angle. Um, the other angle we, we look at is the one between the two metatarsals, between the first and the second metatarsal. We call that the intermetatarsal angle. Normal is less than 9 degrees. This one is not measured, but it's probably about 13 or 14 degrees. So those two are abnormal in folks who have symptomatic bunions, and uh, that becomes important when we talk about how to fix it. The other thing we look at in the x-ray is arthritis. So for those of you who have seen x-rays, arthritis means a stiff joint. So it usually means you've lost that joint space. The cartilage is gone, so the bones are touching each other. You hear the term bone on bone? That's, that's arthritis. That means the, the, there's no cartilage left. Cartilage doesn't have any nerve endings, doesn't have any sensation. So when you lose the cartilage, the bone has a lot of nerve endings. So when bones are touching each other, that causes a lot of pain, and your body responds by trying to make it stiff. And that, that's what causes arthritis. And we see it a fair amount in, in patients with, with bunions or other problems. And so that needs to be addressed a little bit differently. OK, so treatment, as I mentioned, is always going to be conservative to start with. All, all advised patients avoid narrow uh, pointed uh, heeled shoes. And a lot of women look at me like, you got to be crazy. I got to be able to go to work. I got to be able to, to, you know, I got to be able to wear heels. So a lot, a lot of people are, are quite insistent on that um, and aren't, aren't super amenable to, <laughs> to wearing, a, wearing wider toe box shoes. But I'll always say, try to get a shoe with a wider toe box. Try to avoid heels whenever you can. Um, you can stretch out shoes. There are, are ways to do that. Um, uh, it's, not, it's not always the most stylish, but, but it can be done. Um, there are various heel pads that can be worn. There are orthotics can sometimes support the big toe and, uh, and reduce the pressure across it. Um, so there are other things that we can do. There's splinting that, that can help reduce the symptoms. None of this has been shown to reverse the process. There's no way to correct a bunion without doing surgery. Um, there's ways to make it less painful, and that's what we aim for. But there's no way to correct it without surgery. Once it's there, it's there, and, uh, and it, it can't be reversed. So um, I'm going to talk quickly about the, the three types of surgical procedures that we do. And this is sort of a, I stole some of this from a talk that I give to our residents. Um, there are three types of procedures, and they go one, two, three in order of severity. So number one is just doing a t soft tissue release, releasing those tight tendons, tightening up the inside where, where it's a little bit loose. That's for a pretty, a pretty mild bunion. 
Um, two is osteotomy. That means a surgical break in the bone. You break the bone, you realign it, and you get it to heal in that position. That's for kind of the moderate mid-level bunion like the one that I showed you in the x-ray example. And then three is a fusion operation. That means that you deliberately glue the two uh, bones together at the joint uh, and make it stiff. Um, and that's reserved for very severe bunions and those who have, uh, who have underlying arthritis. So this is an example of the soft tissue release. Essentially, the tissues on the outside, which are tight, as I showed you in that example, get released, and the tissues on the inside, where the bunion is, get tightened. And then we always shave off that prominent bunion. And, and this can be a great result in a, in a minor, in a small bunion as this one is. So this is an example preoperatively. Uh, you've probably seen enough x-rays now to know that that's a little bit of a hallux valgus angle. The angle's been corrected, the bunion's been shaved down, and, um, and the patient was able to fit into shoes without pain. So that's kind of our, our goal. Um, I'm going to show a couple of pictures of, of osteotomies. There are a whole b bunch of different types of osteotomies. There's more than 80 that have been described to fix bunions. So some people say if there are that many procedures described to fix something, probably none of them really work. That's not, that's not absolutely true. But there are a lot of different ones that have been described and a lot of uh, variability in the results that have been seen. This is one for a, for a smaller bunion that's down toward the end of the toe. Um, and, uh, and it's essentially realigning the bone, fixing it in place with this small screw and get it to heal um, in, in that position. Um, the fusion operation, um, this is an example of a fusion of, the, of the, the joint on the other side. So that's the metatarsal, and this is the, one of the tarsal bones, it's called the cuneiform. A tarso-metatarsal fusion, TMT fusion. Uh, that was described by, by a, uh, a Dr. Lapidus. And this is a very common primary procedure for bunions that are very, very severe or in people that are very, very flexible. Um, if there's arthritis, again, in the, in the MTP joint, we'll fuse that joint. And so that's a first MTP fu fusion, which is metatarsophalangeal joint. So that's sort of the bunion joint. Um, and so if there's arthritis or if it's really severe deformity, then, then I'll use that operation. This is an example of a, of a moderate bunion deformity. The hallux valgus angle is probably about 30. The IM angle is probably 14 or 15. So we did a, an osteotomy here, and we fixed it with a pin and allowed the osteotomy to heal, as you can see over there. So that straightened out our IM angle, straightened out our toe, so our hallux valgus angle is corrected. And that's kind of what we go for. We go for straightening out the toe, looking at the x-rays make us feel good. Obviously, what's important is that the patient's don't have pain and are able to fit into shoes and, uh, and get back to doing what they love to do. So there's another example of a type of osteotomy we do. Um, again, sort of a moderate bunion. I held this one with a plate, held things straight, and, and, uh, and uh, th this type of thing can result in a very good correction. So our goals are, are reduce pain, straighten the toe, and allow full function. So I'm much happier when a patient comes in and says, I love it, I'm happy, I'm wearing the shoes I want, I'm living life the way I want to than I am looking at the x-rays. And I've seen plenty of folks with beautiful looking x-rays who say, I, I, I could continue to get better. And plenty of folks who have uh, x-rays that make me kind of go like this. And, uh, and, but they're doing great. So um, there, there's, not always, uh, uh, there's not always a correlation between the two. But what we go for is these three things. Reduce pain, get back into shoes, straighten the toe, and, um, and uh, return to function. So um, lesser toe deformities, so the second thing I'm going to talk about, there's three terms, three common terms that we'll use. Claw toe, hammer toe, and mallet toe. Now we do use these a little bit interchangeably, but they each mean different things. They're illustrated here. A claw toe is when the toe is coming up off the ground and it's curved down. So, so the MTP joint back here, it, the toe is curved upward, um, but it's flexed out at the IP joints, the interphalangeal joints. Um, so that's a claw toe. A hammer toe is when it's not bent back here at the MTP joint, but it is at the IP joint, the interphalangeal joint. So that's the one, the toe is sort of straight, but it's hooked down and usually that's digging against the ground. And the last one's the mallet toe, which is just the tip of the toe is, is sort of curled down. So I'll, I'll go through each of these individually. The causes of these are, are quite variable and I'll, and I'll show you the common causes for each one. Um, idiopathic means we don't know what causes it and that's a very common thing in orthopedics. Um, uh, there's inflammatory problems. A lot of it is, a lot of it is tight fitting shoes, neuromuscular problems, degenerative problems. Uh, and then trauma. You stub your toe, you have something land on your toe, and, and it can lead to that. So with, uh, with mallet toes, which again is just the end kind of curved down, that's almost always because of shoes that don't fit right. People who wear shoes that are too short, um, your, your feet do grow over time. Uh, I remember when I was uh, interviewing with, uh, you know, for a job in New York, and uh, one of the guys asked me, do, do your feet continue to grow? 
I thought, yeah, I've never even thought about that. Uh, I actually don't know. I figure when you're done growing, your feet are done growing. So no, they'll, you know, his, his feet had grown a size and a half over the course of his career. And uh, so your feet do continue to grow. Your tissues continue to expand. Um, so some people who don't pay attention to their shoe wear will end up wearing shoes that are too tight and their toes will kind of curl down. You'll get all these, this injury to the toenails and the toe will kind of, kind of go down. They'll come in and say, hey, the bottom of my toe hurts every time I put my shoes on. Um, but it doesn't hurt when I walk barefoot. So um, that's, a, that's a mallet toe. Um, hammer toe deformities, these are usually uh, hooked to a foot with a bunion. Uh, again, as I mentioned, I showed the same picture. As the bunion goes over, as the toe goes to the outside, the second and third toes don't have anywhere to go but up usually. Sometimes they'll go down. Um, but usually a hammer toe is associated with a bunion. So the primary complaint might be, hey, I have my toe sticking up and it hurts. And I say, well, to fix that, we have to fix your bunion also. Um, so that's a, that's a common discussion. Claw toe deformities, again, that's where the toe's coming up off the ground and, it, and it's curled like a claw. Um, these are usually associated with neurologic problems. charcot marie tooth, sometimes when people have strokes um, or have, uh, have uh, other neurologic, neurologic issues, their toes will curl up. And the reason for that is there's more pull on the bottom tendon than there is on the top tendon. So it ends up winning out and the, the toes get curled up like that. So the anatomy of the toe is, is very complex. Uh, it's, it's a lot like the finger. I mean, you can imagine that our toes um, probably used to be fingers, um, and they shortened up as we continue to uh, evolve. Um, so it's a very delicate balance. So if that balance gets disrupted and one tendon starts to win out, it's going to pull the toe in a different direction. You're going to get a deformity. Um, so there are static stabilizers um, that, that allow us to elongate our toes. Um, and. Uh, that the deformities can come whenever there's an imbalance between the tendons. So if you can imagine in this example, the, the extensor tendons are the ones that pull the toes up around the top and the flexor tendons are on the bottom. So if there's an imbalance between the two, then as the toe comes up, for example, um, the, the flexor tendon can start to pull so it can, it can cause a deformity in the toe. And then if, it, if it's held in that position and the, and the toes can't relax because of any of the reasons we talked about, it'll get fixed in that position. And that's where you have a fixed hammer toe that, that you can't straighten out. Um, extr extrinsic factors, again, shoes, uh, one of the most common things, tight fitting shoes, shoes that are too short. Um, what will happen is the top of the shoe will start to push on the IP joint or what we call the PIP joint, the proximal interphalangeal joint, and that sort of drives the toe down, and so you get more pressure on the bottom part of the foot. So both of these can be problematic, and people can develop calluses or thickening in the skin in both of those locations. So tight-fitting shoes are, are, uh, are very common. High heels are, are very common uh, culprits. Um, we divide these into two types, flexible or rigid. It just means can you correct it on your own? Can you take your fingers and, and straighten out your toe? And, um, and that's what I'll do in the clinic. I'll say, can I correct this just by moving this out of the way? And that changes what I decide to do. If it's not correctable, um, we call that rigid, and it's, it's a different procedure, as I'll talk about in a moment. Um, I'll also look at the joints to see if, uh, if there's a, a dislocation of the joints, and that's often easiest, easiest seen on the x-ray. I'll manipulate the joints to see if, um, if, if they're loose, meaning if the ligaments are unstable. So um, if I manipulate a joint and it comes out of place and that causes pain, then, then often that means that there's a problem at the joint and we'll need to address that. Um, so again, the type of deformity, always look at the big toe because that's, that's uh, a very common culprit in, uh, in little toe deformities. Is there enough space between those toes? Um, if we just correct the, the second toe, which is the most common one involved, if we just correct that, is that going to be enough or do we need to, to look at its neighbor? We often want to think ahead and say, we want this to be the last operation if we have to do one. So if there, it, we want to address everything at once um, so that you only have to heal once and you don't have to worry about it again. Um, callus, which is that thickening in the skin, which I'm, you know, I'm sure everybody has had, um, that can be caused, as I, show, as I showed, by a lot of pressure from the bones. Callus are, are pressure related. If you're not putting pressure on something, you're not going to get a callus. So um, a lot of times when those bones are prominent, you can get callus. And when we correct it, the callus will go away. Um, other things we always think about, you know, vascular disease, uh, uh, arthritis, uh, inflammation, these are all things that, that, uh, uh, that do come with experience, unfortunately, in the, in the foot. So we pay attention to that, especially when we get to the point of discussing, uh, uh, discussing surgery. Always get x-rays to look at the joints to see if there are other things we need to do to straighten everything out. Um, again, I like uh, the first operation to be the last operation, so we're very thorough in, uh, in evaluating the entire foot. 
and we want to make sure that if a toe is going the wrong direction, as this, as this one is, that it gets corrected if we end up needing a new surgery. Also, this is an example of uh, arthritis in that IP joint and a little bit of subluxation or, or uh, the joints bounced out of place a little bit. Okay, so our, our goals uh, are, are basically a, a painless toe. Like what I want is for somebody to be able to function without pain. Now patients, there's a lot of variability in the goals, but, it, but in general, most patients want their toe to touch the floor when they walk, they don't want it sticking up. Um, they want less pain, they want less swelling, um, and they want uh, return to function. And one thing I didn't add is they want to be able to wear shoes. So those are all very realistic, and, and it's a very individual conversation that I have with every patient. Um, are their goals consistent with what we can actually expect to achieve? Um, and, uh, and that's when we would proceed if we need to. Um, we'll always exhaust all the non-operative options first, and uh, these are successful the majority of times. I'll spend a lot of time talking to patients about what we can try to reduce pain and, and improve function without having to do surgery. And if we try all that and, and the patient's not happy with their level of function, then we'll start to, we'll start to discuss surgical options. Okay, so um, just, uh, just quickly, there, there are sort of two operations that we'll do in general for, uh, for hammer toe, claw toe, and, hammer, or, and uh, mallet toe deformities. Uh, tendon releases are what we'll do typically for our flexible deformity. Sometimes we'll transfer the tendons that flex the toe up, up to the top so they function to extend the toe. And that's basically if, if one tendon's winning out over the other, then we'll move it to the other side so that it can actually help us. It can actually, uh, it can actually be our friend. Instead of a deforming force, it'll actually be a corrective force. So those, are, uh, those can be very effective for flexible deformities. For rigid or stiff deformities, the cat's sort of out of the bag, so just moving the tendons around isn't going to be enough to, to correct that. We usually have to take out that stiff joint and sometimes fuse that stiff joint so the toe is straight and in the right position. So for recurrent, uh, uh, for recurrent deformities, for those that come back despite surgery, and that, that happens a, a fair amount, it's not, it's not uh, completely uncommon, that's when we talk about doing fusion procedures and, and even putting implants in there to to kind of hold things straight, that, that's, uh, that's very effective. Amputation is not something that I do a lot of for, for toes, but um, I, I know people around the country who do a lot and they have very happy patients, uh, at least they report very happy patients. Uh, for me, it's a little bit, uh, it's a difficult discussion. Most people don't like to have their toes taken off, although I'll admit that I've had patients come to me and say, look, I'm tired of this toe, just, it's not functioning, <laughs> I don't mind, just take it off, I just wanna wear sandals. And, and that's a, you know, it's a, it, while it feels a little bit like a failure as a surgeon, it's actually, you know, um, it's actually a, uh, a, a very useful thing. And I have done it successfully and, and patients have loved it. Um, so that's an option, you know, as long as you can get over the, uh, the, the cosmetics, cosmetic issues, um, then, uh, then that can be a really useful procedure to consider in the armamentarium. So complications, uh, uh, there are a lot of nerves that go to the toes. Sometimes they can get irritated. Some patients can complain of, uh, of irritation in their nerves. Not getting enough correction or getting too much correction um, are, are very, very common. Hyperextension of the IP joint, which is that, uh, that sort of swan neck deformity where the joint actually goes down, um, that's something that, uh, that, that we can see as well. So um, to the extent that any of these things bother the patient, they can be addressed. Uh, but these are some of the common things that we see. That's that uh, IP hyperextension. Um, so uh, a guy named Lehman uh, uh, published uh, in 1995 um, a big series of, uh, of toe surgeries. And uh, he reported that, you know, he attempted fusion operations in the IP joint. They reported that 95% had successful fusion, meaning on x-ray, thumbs up, high fives, looks great. 48% of his patients were satisfied. So only half of the patients were satisfied, but almost everybody actually had what, what we'd consider a successful operation uh, in terms of the x-ray. 26% um, of those had, a, had an abnormal alignment, meaning that the, the toe was either too straight or it was pointing in the wrong direction. Um, another guy named Mike Coughlin who practices in Boise, and I, I know him well, um, he's, a, he's a very, very good surgeon, very honest guy. Um, so he also published a series uh, about, about a decade ago. Um, and he used these K-wires to fix, it's a common thing, I use this also, uh, to, fix, uh, to fix toes. And he had a fusion rate of 81%. Now in orthopedics, you know, the, our cutoff is sort of 90%. I, I don't like doing operations that I can't say there's better than 90% chance that, that, uh, that this is gonna help you and this is gonna work. Um, so this is, this is probably one of those under 90% uh, operations. Um, I'll, I'll tell you, my, my Coughlin um, 
is a great guy. Patients absolutely love him. I mean, I, I'm convinced that patients go to him and, and no matter what's going on, they say, hey, I'm doing great. 84% satisfaction, which for toe surgery is great, but that means 16% of the patients were, were unhappy. And uh, he's a hard guy to be unhappy with, so that's, that's, uh, that's a, a meaningful statistic in, in, uh, in my opinion. So, and, and again, in, in their studies, the biggest issues were numbness and malalignment. So if a nerve gets irritated and they can't feel the toe, or if uh, the toes are pointing in a, in, a, in a bad direction or not in the direction that they wanted, those are the two things that are associated with, uh, with the patient being unhappy. In general, the stiffer the toe, the better, meaning if it's too flexible, it's more likely to, to have the tendons pull it in the wrong direction. So um, we always consider all possibilities. We always exhaust all non-operative treatments. Um, and, and we avoid high expectations. Now, I'm, I'm not meaning to discourage, to discourage anybody, um, and this is a conversation that I have frequently with patients. Um, surgery can be very, very helpful, and uh, it, when we get to the point of discussing it, my expectation is always that it's going to be helpful or else I wouldn't do it. Um, but this is one area where there's, uh, th there is potential for frustration on the part of patients despite things going exactly the way we want them to. So, um, this is an area where I always caution patients as we as we move towards surgery, and it's something to consider um, uh, as uh, you know if you get to the point or if you know somebody gets to the point of uh, of discussing surgery. Um, it's not always a uh, hundred percent. Okay, so the last thing that I'm going to talk about, I think we're okay on time, um, is is hallux rigidus. And hallux is the big toe, so we're going to go back to the big toe. Hallux rigidus comes from Greek for stiff big toe, so it basically means that the big toe is getting stiff and it, it's getting bone spurs. Um, this is the second most common condition affecting the joint after bunions. You can see on this x-ray, this is a side x-ray, and that's a big bone spur up on top of that metatarsal, and there's a little bone spur there. So that's pretty classic for, for hallux rigidus. This is a condition that we don't see in couch potatoes. This is something I only see in active people, and, and usually they can remember injuring their toe at some point, often years before. Um, so this is, a, this is a, a, a relatively common disease of experienced feet. Um, so again, stiffness of the first MTP joint, metatarsophalangeal joint. A lot of names that have been given to it, hallux flexus, dorsal bunion, because it looks like a bunion up on top. Um, metatarsus primus elevatus, which means the metatarsal sticking up a little bit. Um, those are all, all also names that have been given to it. There are two groups, in the adolescent group, it, it usually involves a, a defect in the cartilage. And that's a little picture there. I'm not gonna talk about that, because that's uh, not, the, not the topic for today. That's a little osteochondral defect on the metatarsal head. So in the adult, it's usually associated with some destruction of the joint. And there are basically four grades. You know, grades one and two are, are, are mild, and grades three and four are a little bit more severe. And I'll, I'll introduce those terms as I go. Um, usually it comes from trauma and then overuse. So you walk around a bunch, you wear flexible shoes, um, you start to build those bone, stir, bone spurs, eventually your, your toe gets stiff and you have pain when you walk. Um, so most patients will come in with complaining of a prominence on that big toe, a big bump or a, or a bunion. Um, they have painful and difficult range of motion. They can't get their toe up. They notice that when they walk, sometimes they shift onto the outside part of their foot because they can't get their big toe up. Um, incidentally, to, to walk, you need at least 40 degrees of upward motion of your MTP joint. Um, well, 40 degrees to run, 30 degrees to walk. Um, and most patients with this uh, disease are not able to do that. So if you can't get your big toe up when you walk, you're gonna rock over to the outside part of your foot and start to develop other problems. Um, so sometimes people will present with a nerve getting irritated by that bump. Sometimes, as uh, is illustrated here, they'll shift over to the outside of their foot and they'll develop pain on the outside part of their foot or even callus on the outside part of their foot. So those are, uh, those are common presenting complaints. Um, <clears throat> so I always push on the bottom of the, of the foot. The sesamoid bones are those two bones that sit right underneath the big toe joint. Um, and if those are painful, then sometimes that means there's, there's some arthritis in, in those joints as well. So uh, uh, we have a little bit of a different conversation in those cases. Uh, we always look at the alignment of the toe. Again, some of these are associated with bunions or other, other malalignments that might need to be addressed. Um, we'll get x-rays. So same types of x-rays. Again, this is, a, this is a normal x-ray of that normal joint. This is a hallux rigidus where the joint is flattened. We've lost a lot of the joint space and we have these big spurs on the inside, the outside, and up on the top. So that's a big bone spur up on top and you can feel that in, in, uh, in this patient. So we'll, we'll always start with conservative treatment first as we do with everything else. Uh, Non-steroidal anti-inflammatory medications, that's Motrin, Aleve, uh, ibuprofen, over-the-counter stuff. Celebrex is one of the prescription ones that we use. Um, that can calm down the inflammation. 
reducing activities, at least giving people a period of rest. And in my experience, patients don't love to hear, don't be active. Um, so I'll usually introduce a brief period of rest and try some of these other things to reduce the pain and then slowly start to increase activities. Um, and if that doesn't work, then obviously surgery can be, uh, uh, can be an option. Shoe wear modifications. Um, arch supports can be helpful for this. Stiff insoles. So we can get rigid, uh, what's called a turf toe plate if you get it at a running store or an orthotic store, um, or a, uh, a stainless steel or a carbon fiber insole for the shoe. And the idea is that if, you're, if the bottom of the shoe is stiff, you don't have to get your big toe up when you're walking because your shoe will do it with you. So you know if anyone who wears boots or stiff shoes, you know you don't use your toes nearly as much in stiff shoes as you do in tennis shoes or flexible shoes. So that can be a helpful treatment. Cortisone injections, this is one area where I'll, where I'll use cortisone. It's an inflammatory issue. There's usually some arthritis. Inject a little cortisone into the joint, which I do under x-ray in the office. That calms everything down and, and uh, often lasts a long time. I've had patients who have uh, relief for years after one of those. Um, that's not always the case, but, but uh, sometimes is. So the surgical treatment is, uh, is relatively simple, and this is actually one that's very effective. Uh, we call it a dorsal chalectomy. It just means removing those big bone spurs from the top of the metatarsal and the phalanx. Uh, so it was described in the 1930s by a guy named Nilsson, and uh, uh, Roger Mann, who's over here on the East Bay, uh, was the one who popularized it in, uh, in the late 70s and 80s, and, um, and this has become sort of the procedure of choice uh, for, uh, as a, uh, primarily for these, uh, for these problems. Um, w uh, the incision's usually up on the top of the toe. Uh, we go just to the other side of the tendon. That's the safest area. Pretty rare to, to injure a nerve or, or anything like that, so it's a, it's a pretty straightforward, easy procedure. And this is kind of what it looks like. We use a small little saw, um, and we just shave down that bone spur that's up on the top. And, and always in the operating room, we're able to get the toe up to 80 degrees. So I'll see one that's stiff, that can't get past neutral, always able to get them up to 80 degrees when we take the bone spur away. And, uh, and release some of the tissues. So and that's just a, a picture of it from surgery. Um, and this is kind of what it looks like. And there, there's often spurs on either side, so we'll take those out at the same time um, just to relieve anything that could cause pressure or pain. So the colectomy is best for, for, uh, for the lower stages, for stage one and two. Um, you know, we looked up uh, a, a bunch of our patients who we'd done for stage three, which is kind of the more arthritic types. And the majority of them still do well. Um, only three out of 126 ended up needing a fusion procedure, which is sort of a bailout uh, definitive operation um, uh, for the advanced hallux ridges for the arthritis. Um, and, uh, and so the majority of people still do well with this operation. The advantage to it is, um, and then fusion is for the advanced stages um, or if there's significant arthritis in the sesamoids. The advantage to it is that the, the recovery is actually pretty quick. You know, we can get, I get people walking essentially immediately after surgery, and usually they're able to get into regular shoes within three or four weeks, back to running in about six weeks. Um, and what I do with my athletes, I tell them expect to be back to full go at two months, um, which for, for surgery is pretty quick. So, so that's, uh, that's part of the upside. You don't have to do crutches or any of that stuff. Um, so osteotomies, uh, which again is that surgical break in the bone to realign things, We'll use this occasionally with hallux rigidus, and it's basically when there's a, when there's a strange alignment, when the toe is pointing in, the, in a bad direction as is in a bunion, or when the toe is pointing downward, or when the metatarsal is uh, angled upward. Um, that's when we'll start to talk about moving things out of the way to prevent something like this from occurring again. And the idea is that um, we want enough upward and downward motion. So in this illustration, this is before surgery, you can see that big spur there shave the spur off and do this osteotomy to bring the toe up. And it decompresses the top part of the joint, so there's more space, and obviously this is just an illustration, but there's most, more space in the top of the joint, so there's better range of motion. And this can be a really helpful adjunct in those patients. Uh, again, low-grade um, uh, uh, low hallux rigidus, um, clinical and by x-ray, sometimes can, uh, can benefit from a, an osteotomy of the phalanx. Um, <laughs> Running athletes, regardless of severity, this can be a really, a really useful operation. Because um, if you can imagine somebody who's trying to play basketball or volleyball, if they can't get their toe up past 20 degrees, it's really difficult to run and cut and jump. So, so this can be a really useful operation um, that's, a, that's a pretty easy recovery. So and again, this is an illustration in surgery of being able to get, this one is actually up to about 90 degrees. Um, and that's, a, you know, that's an example of the size of the incision. So, um, and, the, and again, a, a phalanx osteotomy is, uh, is what we would use if I couldn't get someone up to, to 90 degrees in the operating room. So and this is a, just another illustration of it. 
That's our dors dorsal chylectomy, and then that's that proximal phalanx osteotomy. We close that space down, let the bone heal in that position. Um, it's just another illustration of it. So our goal is to get about 20 or 30 degrees of more dorsiflexion just at the, on the failing side, and that's addition to what we're able to get through the MTP joint, um, and uh, so that can be highly successful. So your feet are, uh, are very important. Um, I always encourage uh, all my patients and everybody to, to take good care of them, pay close attention to them, you know, especially as they gain more experience, um, problems can become more, more frequent, and it becomes more and more important to uh, uh, to pay attention to what shoes you're wearing, to pay attention to, to small aches and pains, to make sure they don't become big aches and pains. Always choose appropriate shoes for your feet and for your activity. Um, there are a lot of options available out there uh, you know, these days. There's a lot of research going into them. You know, there's these uh, MBT shoes that, that some of you may have seen, the kind of rocker bottom shoe. Um, there's a lot of research coming out on those, and, and I'm starting to see a lot of success with them, so I'm getting some research projects going. Um, surgery is usually not the first option for, uh, for uh, the majority of these experience-related uh, foot problems. Um, it is something that can be a useful, uh, useful consideration when, uh, uh, when other treatments have failed, uh, but it's important mainly to, to be educated on, on what you can do to get things feeling better and, and what the options are so you can make, a, make an educated choice as you go. And as I always tell patients, you know, get, get moving, get to live in life. That's what our, uh, that's what our goal is. to to be uh, out and about and be standing up and running around and, uh, and not sitting down. So I'll uh, take any questions you have. Yeah. Uh, I just wanted to ask, what do you do about heel pain? Um, so that, that's, a whole, that's a whole other talk. Um, uh, so heel pain is probably the most common thing that we see and the most common heel pain problem is plantar fasciitis. Um, and uh, so there's you know, it, it really depends on where the pain is coming from. If it is plantar fasciitis. The whole heel, it's like the whole base of the whole heel. The whole base of the heel? Yeah. Not, not the bottom, but the? It's the, bo it's the bottom part of it. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. It, you know, I, I would, it's, it's, it's hard to answer that shortly. There, there are a lot of different things that can cause it and a lot of different ways to treat it. Usually it involves, you know, some level of stretching and uh, something cushioned in the shoe, like a, a cushioned orthotic for the shoe. Um, but it really depends on whether it involves the Achilles tendon, and, and I would always get x-rays on patients with that complaint to make sure there's not an abnormal bone spur or a fracture or something like that. So hard, hard to answer just uh, succinctly, but yeah. And that literally is a whole other talk. Yeah. Do you find from treating it that a pretty good percentage of the patients get back and, and lose the pain from the plantar fasciitis and, and, and get back to where they? It, in, uh, in my experience about, um, I would say between 90 and 95 percent of people um, are able to uh, get rid of the pain for a long period of time. The the uh, quickly it is variable. So some people yes, but most people it can take a few months. But I'll tell you, and this has been studied pretty extensively uh, because it's the most it's the most common thing that we see. Um, stretching and continued stretching is the number one thing to help it go away and to keep it from from coming back. So that usually involves stretching not only the plantar fascia but also the Achilles because they're kind of continuous. They're in one layer. So you stretch it all out, and it can take months before it really goes away. Um, but if you stay, patients who stick with it can get rid of it for good. About it's about 95 percent of the time. So the, the question was, how bad does a does a bunion or hallux rigidus have to be before you'd consider seeking treatment for it? Um, and, and my answer is that that's somewhat variable. It, it depends on kind of what your expectations are. My, my rule of thumb, most people who have those problems, by the time they get to me, they've tried a whole bunch of other stuff because they've gone to their primary care doctor and, um, and, and or tried some things over the counter or, or looked online and got some from a website. So usually they've, they've had it for, for several months. Um, so it, my advice is always, if it's limiting your, your ability to live your life the way you want to, you can't find shoes, uh, let me divide these up actually, for, for bunions, if you can't find shoes that are comfortable, not just I can't wear the high heels, but, mm -hmm. but if you can't find shoes that are comfortable where you can, you can live your life the way you want to, um, and it's starting to affect your other toes, that's when I'd recommend doing something, something about it. Um, so people who come in and say, I don't like this bump on my foot, uh, but I don't have any limitations, I can run a marathon and all that, then you know, I, 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 don't, I certainly wouldn't do anything surgically <laughs> consider trying some of these other toe spacers and things like that. Um, but, but when you start to, to seek the real discussion is when it starts to impact your, your ability to live your life and, uh, and do what you want to do, and you just can't find shoes that fit. And for hallux rigidus, it, it's, it's essentially just, is it impacting your activities? You know, have you tried all these other conservative things and, um, 
and it's still impacting your activities. That when you, that's when you can start to, to think about trying something like an injection and, and uh, even physical therapy to try to increase the motion. Um, so it's, it's highly individual, but, but if it's really impacting you and it's not getting better, yeah, it's definitely worth coming in and have, having a look at it. And coming in and seeing a surgeon or seeing Well, I, you know, I, I usually recommend going, go to your primary care doctor first because a lot of times, that, you know, the primary care docs at Stanford and I, I assume elsewhere in the community are, are, uh, are excellent. And, and they can often do those first non-operative things and, uh, and sort of nip things in the bud. And then if that doesn't work, then they'll bump it up to me and they'll, they'll refer you to me or a, you know, a, a surgeon. And, uh, and you can kind of have that discussion about what might work for you um, beyond what you've already tried. So I would start with like a primary care doctor. So the, the question is that the, the second and third toes were curled up where the knuckles of the toes were sticking up. Mm -hmm. um, but uh, you were told that it was not arthritis, but it was a hereditary tendon disorder? Yeah. Okay, and are the toes flexible at all? Um, Could you straighten them out yeah, on your own? flexible. It just hurts, you know, it's the, the, the shoes. You know, okay, the yeah, because because you get like callus right. in the top ribs. So, so that, it can be arthritis, and you really need x-rays to know for sure, but if there's no arthritis in the, in the joints and the toes are not fixed, then that, that's usually from a tendon imbalance. So it's not as much a tendonitis as it is a, a tendon imbalance, meaning one's stronger than the other. So as the toe goes up and the, the flexor tendons are strong, then anytime you walk and you pull those tendons, they're both working to pull the toe back. So it kind of works like an accordion. Um, and, and that's, you know, like there's obviously very conservative things that you can do. I'd, I'd choose shoes that are maybe a half size larger and maybe a bit wider. Um, you can get what's called a toe crest that, that it will fit underneath those toes and help straighten them out when you're in, your, when you're in a shoe. Um, you can get toe crest, yeah. You can get corn pads, which are just pads you put like a little donut pad on top and that helps block it from, from hitting the top of your shoe. So those are things to try. So the, the question is, I showed a couple of pictures of uh, some splints for the big toe and for some spacers uh, between the toes. Um, and, and my answer to that question is, uh, I'll, I'll repeat what I said before, that uh, none of those can correct a, a bunion deformity. Um, they can kind of hold it in that position and they can reduce pain. So um, there are, in general, two types of splints. One is very hard, very stiff, and that's obviously more effective to hold it in position. That's one you wear at night. The other one's soft, a little more flexible, and that's one you can wear in a shoe or, or during the day. So um, th there's no real program for it. I would say try it. They're, they're not expensive, you know, they're pretty cheap. So uh, try it, and, and so try wearing one at night while you're sleeping, and then you can wear a soft splint during the day when you're walking around in a, in a sandal or in a relatively wide shoe. And uh, if that alleviates your pain, then, then you can stick with it sort of as, as much as you want. There's been no studies that have shown that doing that will make your toes straight or slow down the, uh, a bunion, but it, if it makes you comfortable, I think it's absolutely worthwhile. So, so the question is that, uh, uh, that you, you had, uh, sounds like a, a lot of surgery to one of your feet. I have and a fin in the tail of the bunion, and so my foot is quite stiff. Okay. Um, so, and the foot's still, still stiff, so you have trouble finding shoes that'll fit yeah. that, sh that foot by itself. And then if you do find a shoe that fits, the matching one doesn't work because your other foot's yeah. smaller and, and um, more and flexible. Foot is yeah. <laughs> so the, there, are, um, there, there are two options. It's one is you can do a custom shoe. Um, two is you can buy mismatched shoes. Um, there are some uh, department stores and shoe stores that will sell you a mismatched shoe, but um, I, I would probably go to a, to a specialty shoe store where they can modify a shoe to accommodate the, the more stiff one. Yeah. Will sell you two different sizes, right. but it has to be a size and a half difference between the two. Oh, really? That's interesting. Yeah. Yeah, it's ridiculous. Yeah, yeah and because they'd be able to, you know, if you go to a place like Foot Solution, there are other ones. Uh, there are other ones around, um, but they'd be able to modify a shoe, not only not only give you a um, a mismatched pair, but modify the the one or put an orthotic in it to make sure that it's comfortable. So that's what I would do. So the question was, what's the recovery time for, for a bunion surgery? For most bunion surgeries, you're in a, a dressing of some type for six weeks. Now, it depends entirely on what is done, whether you're walking or not. For most of them, you're able to walk in a boot. So you're in a short boot that protects you and keeps your foot still and is wide. Um, but you, I, I change the dressings every two weeks for, until six weeks. And then after six weeks, you get into regular shoes. I always tell people the last thing to go away is the swelling. You know, the feet is as far away from the heart as it can get, and it's almost always downhill. So it's, it's hard to, to clear all the swelling out of the feet. Um, so 
it, the, the most common thing is that three months, patients are in regular shoes, they're having no pain, they're doing everything they want to do, but often their feet are still swollen. So there's a lot of Dr. Hunt, I love it, it looks beautiful, but it's still swollen. And, um, and so that, that's, that's kind of the progression of things. Usually by four months, you're, you're, you're functioning fully. Yeah, and by, by between six and eight weeks, you're, you're getting into your regular issues. So you had a ruptured plantar fascia and a couple of other either alignment issues or, or tendon problems, and um, you went to have a custom orthotic made, it sounds like, or they offered you a custom orthotic. Okay, yeah, you tried super feet. Okay. <clears throat> yeah. For, for that situation, I, I think typically a custom orthotic would be, uh, would be useful, and, and, and orthotics are yet another talk in and of themselves, if we really want to go into it, but just to, to be brief, I, I think that um, there's very little science. Like, I, you know, I'm, a, I'm a, an MD, and, and we're very scientific-based. You know, when we practice, we like to see that other people have reported on things that we do and say that it works, and then obviously, in our experience, it works. So there's not a lot of science behind orthotics. So, um, and there's a lot of different philosophies on how they're made. So my opinion is, I, I think for, for people just like you and for a lot of people with, uh, with uh, alignment issues or that need to have their foot accommodated in a way that a, an over-the-counter orthotic can't do, a custom orthotic can be useful. It makes sense to do that with somebody who's able to do modifications of that orthotic if, there's, if it needs to be tweaked a little bit, if you have too much pressure in, in one area or not enough in another area and watch you walk and make sure that it's working for you. So I would go, you wanna to go to a, a, a ped orthotist, somebody who specializes in creating foot orthotics. And that's different than just a, an orthotist, it's a ped orthotist. Um, uh, foot solutions for sure. There's a guy uh, named Gary Burke who's right here on Brewster Avenue um, who does a great job. I, I send a lot of patients to him also. Um, but he's you know, user friendly and he would mold your foot and, and, uh, and such. I like cushion materials. I don't like stiff materials. You know, the super feet are a little bit stiff. Um, so I like, uh, I like a, a, more, a more cushioned material and, uh, and Gary uh, agrees with that and he uses that and the results that I've seen have been good. Um, the best over-the-counter orthotic that I've seen, and by the way, I have no relationships with any of these people, so I don't, I'm not, uh, you know, there's no, there's no uh, quid pro quo or anything like that. Um, uh, the best over-the-counter orthotics that I've seen uh, are the brand at, at Foot Solutions. And they're a little, for over-the-counter, they're a little bit expensive. They're like $60, whereas if you go to get a Dr. Scholl's pair, they're probably $15. If you go to a running store and get some of the higher-end ones, they're $30. Um, the reason I like them is they're, it's a cushion material. It's the full length of the insole, and, um, and they have uh, varying heights to the arch. So you can put it on the ground, you can, you can step on it and see what's comfortable. And to me, that's what it's about for, for, I would say, the majority of what I send people to orthotics for. It's about get being comfortable and having your arch supported and having the alignment of your foot supported and, and sometimes having it slightly corrected. So I would go to one of those places, um, and, uh, and again, they're all very close to here, um, and, uh, and have a custom one made and, and make sure that it fits right. Um, the big downside of custom orthotics is cost. You know, they're, they're, uh, they vary a lot, but, but you're looking at, you know, usually between $250 and $350, which is a lot. Um, but, uh, you know, it, it, when, it's, uh, when it becomes necessary, insurance will sometimes pay for it. Um, but uh, when it becomes necessary, that can be a really useful thing. Uh, so the question was, can a callus turn into a neuroma? Um, not exactly. Uh, so a, a, a neuroma is uh, you know, an irritation of a nerve that runs between the toes. Um, and uh, you know, well, there are different types of neuromas, so that's the most common one that we see in the feet. So if you have a callus, it can suggest that you have an alignment that will lead to a neuroma, but it doesn't, like one won't turn into a neuroma, but it may give you a heads up that, hey, you're loading your foot abnormally, and that may cause you to develop other problems like a neuroma. To maintain healthy feet when you're walking around the house, what's the best type of shoe to wear? Um, I have two answers to that. Number one is it depends on what type of foot feet you have. Um, and uh, in general, wear what's comfortable. So that can be slippers, that can be tennis shoes, that can be just regular flats. Um, a lot of people are very comfortable walking around barefoot and that's fine. Um, you know, there are some that believe that we're designed to walk barefoot and, and shoes are actually uh, counterproductive for our foot health. Um, obviously that's out of the bag for all of us because we've been wearing shoes our whole lives so our, our feet are deconditioned, if you believe that. Um, but uh, so I would say do what's comfortable. Um, if you have pain walking bare feet, I would, I would recommend something that's softer 
that gives you a lot of cushion in the sole and uh, supports your foot in the position it wants to be in. Um, and, and that's just sort of in general terms. And obviously, if you, if, they, you know, if you have pain from an issue, then that's different. But, but just walking around, I would, I would do what, what is comfortable for you. Um, so it sounds like this, uh, uh, this very nice woman has a bunion that has a, uh, what has been called a, a bursitis over the top of it. Um, that's sort of shaped like a donut, has a little hole in the middle of it. it you know, it, it, it's a lot of times patients who develop bunions, because you're putting so much pressure on it, you can develop a lot of swelling or even fluid collections over, uh, over the bunion. It's not a true bursitis because it's not an actual bursa, but, but it, you can develop like a, a really thick fluid collection that sits over it. Um, and it's just essentially fluid swelling in the tissues. So I, I would have to look at it, obviously, to, to be able to say for sure, but sometimes that can be um, corrected by correcting the bunion if it is a, a more of a severe bunion. If, it, if it's real painful when you're wearing shoes, which it sounds like it is, that's something that you could consider um, because you mentioned you're not able to find shoes that fit, right? You can't. Yeah, even in tennis shoes, um, I have to look for those ones who has a net and doesn't have any stripe because that stripe will uh, do a pressure in that area, and uh, I can wear it. Yeah, well, that's. I mean, I'd have to. I'd have to look at you probably to, to know for sure. But um, it, you know, that it, it may be if, if it's a if it's a severe bunion, that might be one to consider fixing. You know, get get the toes straight and and clean up or or what we call debris or remove a lot of that swelling that you have. Um, that might be a real effective thing for you. Anti-inflammatories, and then after a while, it will be gone. But it's going to be a year now. Yeah. And it's getting yeah. worse and worse because, obviously, yeah. in the sense that it's still there, it's still doing a pain, and it limits me to get even a comfortable shoe. Yeah, well, that's frustrating. Um, you can try, if you haven't yet, yeah, you can try like a toe spacer or one of these bunion splints. You've tried that, and it doesn't, yeah. So that it might be one to consider, like you know, at least discussing the options of fixing it. You getting X-rays and and seeing what it looks like. What's prescribed for for another problem is the, like a patch that has the prophenac, the drug. Yeah, yeah. And that comes, but you know, you wear for two or three days, comes lower the irritation, and then. And then it comes back. Yeah. And so the the last comment that she made was. Um, a diclofenac patch, which is an anti-inflammatory medication that is made in a patch form. And so that's basically just putting an anti-inflammatory onto the tissues. Um, and uh, that, that can be an effective thing also because it is a, a sort of an inflammatory issue that you're talking about. But it doesn't surprise me that it's not. Once you take the patch off, it, you know, the anti-inflammatory effect sort of goes away. Yeah, for a year. Yeah. Well, yeah, that's something that I would. Yeah, I would. I mean, I'm happy to look at you, right? You know, there's uh, plenty of docs around who I'm sure would want to look at you and at least discuss your options and and talk about what what could be helpful. So the the question was, um, uh, can neuromas heal naturally? Where a, a neuroma is a a nerve uh, right here between these two bones. So as you can see, there's not a lot of space between these metatarsal bones. And actually, this is the most common location for it between the third and the fourth. So um, on, on both sides is bone, and on the top and the bottom are ligaments, and the nerve runs right through the middle. So neuroma is just when the, the, uh, the body of that nerve gets irritated by something. Weird foot alignment, injury, swelling, pregnancy, like a lot of those things can cause, uh, can cause a neuroma to flare up. Once the swelling goes down and it's no longer irritated, it'll go away. So there are things we can do to, to help it go down, like inject anti-inflammatory medications, rest it, immobilize it in a boot, uh, wear an orthotic to offload the metatarsals. There are a lot of things we can do, but it, it can sometimes go away when the irritation goes away. So that, that's one that um, you know, we're definitely not aggressive surgically on neuromas because a lot of, a lot of times they, they will go away either on their own or with some very simple changes. Uh, so the question was, uh, with, uh, with the experienced foot, uh, how, much, how much of these changes are related to the soft tissues and how much are related to the bone? Um, it's a very good question. It's a little bit hard to answer succinctly. Um, with, uh, with bunions, it's pr uh, the deformity is predominantly related to the bone. And I would say that's the same with, with hammer toes and with the hallux rigidus. So the majority of these types of problems are related to the bone. 
because uh, the bone is sort of where things can get worse. But the pain is often related to the soft tissues, irritated nerves, stretching of the tissues, pressure against the shoe. Um, so both of them need to be addressed, but, but the bone is, 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 I think, more often than not the, the uh, uh, primary etiologic factor. It's the one that's, that's sort of developing a deformity and causing the, the pressure on skin, nerve, or, or, or muscle, or soft tissue. Uh, yeah, great, great, so the great question, and so the, the more specific question was, uh, was what are the changes that are occurring in bone or soft tissue that are, that are leading to these problems? Um, uh, there are a lot of things that, that happen in ligaments and tendons and, uh, and the capsule of joints. You lose some of the, the good, healthy collagen and elastin and these other little fibers that, that, uh, you know, that, that give you good strength. Um, so those, those molecules or those fibers become less and less uh, 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 prevalent in, uh, in tissues as we age. So you're not able to hold the tissues uh, together as much. Just like an elastic band, if you keep stretching an elastic band out, eventually it's gonna lose its elasticity and just sort of be you know, a, little bit, uh, a little bit stiff. So the same thing happens to the tissues. We lose our elasticity, um, uh, which is a, a molecule called elastin, and uh, collagen, and there are some others. So we lose some of that, and the tissue gets thin, and it gets a little bit more flimsy, and it heals a little less readily. Bone also heals less readily, uh, and you have less calcium as you, as you get older, and that's where osteopenia and osteoporosis come in. Um, you, you produce fewer of the factors that allow you to heal both bone and soft tissues, so things are a little bit slower to heal. Um, and I do notice you know, a difference between a 30-year-old you know, and, and an 80-year-old um, if I'm doing any of these procedures, the tissues are much less thick and they're much, much less uh, um, uh, sort of uh, uh, flexible. Yep. Okay. Um, well, thank you very much. I appreciate the opportunity.